how the sale of my 17 unit complex ended up with a profit thanks to insurance. Let's get started. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode at Nova Rice. And today's episode is actually a follow-up episode to this video that you see here on the screen where I share my story about how I ended up uh, deciding to sell my 17-unit complex. So for those who haven't watched the episode and for those who watch it but probably need a bit of a refresh, the sale of the 17-unit complex was actually sold at a loss. However, just right around that time, uh, we ended up with an accident in one of the properties and um, it caught fire. And in the end, the insurance ended up declaring that property to be a total loss. So when you take the sum of the sales price, even though it was at a loss, when you add it with the insurance money, mm -hmm. the combined sum of those two wind up in a profit and quite a sizable one. So that's how in essence the a 17 unit was sold at a profit. And in that video, a lot of you ended up asking a lot of questions about insurance, tips that we could actually share in this channel. And so we wanted to take this opportunity to answer those insurance related questions. Uh, there were a couple of other questions about what I decided to do with the sales proceed. Um, we are currently reinvesting that money. However, we cannot share in detail how that's happening, what we're doing, where we're investing it, because uh, I usually like to wait for the entire experience to take place so that way I can capture all the lessons learned and create an episode uh, that is actually well prepared with the right information and not yeah. something that is just, you know, done halfway with a lot of maybe. So stay tuned. We will soon be sharing that experience once we close on those deals. But today we're going to talk about insurance and you were responsible <laughs> of piling up all of the questions. So let's get started with them. Yeah. Before getting started, I wanted to start this conversation by saying that many of us, we think that having insurance on something is just a waste of money. Most of us, we don't even get insurance on most of the products that we buy. But in this case, having insurance was a good bet on your side. And the first question that I have is, how does the cost of insurance fit in your cash flow? Is this something that you calculate right away? Meaning uh, when you're calculating how much cash flow are you going to get from a property after like the property taxes, insurances, is that something that you calculate in the cash flow? Yeah, insurance is something that you have to factor in and your calculations to determine whether you're getting cash flow or not yeah. in a property. So um, when you're investing in real estate, there's two types of expenses. Let's just start there, right? That everybody should consider. There is the financial expenses and then there's the operating expenses or the operating costs. So anything that's financial related has to do with the money, right? So in this case, the insurance. And anything that's operations related, it's whatever expenses you have to incur in order to keep that property running. It could be utilities. Uh, if you live in a state where the utilities are covered, like for example, in New York State, you have to provide heat, right? Like you can't just rent an apartment and not give people heat. So that's just a simple example. So going back into insurance and the topic of finances, with insurance, it's kind of tricky because depending on how you have your insurance set up, mm -hmm. it could be considered a financial expense or it could be an operating expense. What do I mean by that? So lenders, if you're purchasing a property with a mortgage, which is for the majority of us, right? Uh, mortgage companies, they have their way to collect all the money up front simply because they just like it that way. So when you make a mortgage payment, um, the mortgage payment usually covers four type of payments. The interest that they charge in the mortgage, uh, the payment towards the debt, which they call principal, payment towards insurance, and payment towards property taxes. So let's say if you get your mortgage bill, you will actually see the breakdown. You will see, let's say, for example, if your mortgage comes out to be $2,000 a month, right? You will see $500 going towards the principal maybe $700 going towards interest. And the difference is going to go to an account, which they call escrow. And escrow 
is an account that lenders have to keep on the side to collect money that will go towards your property taxes and your insurance. So at the end of the year or at the end of the insurance cycle, the bank will use that money that they set aside to pay for the property taxes and pay for the insurance. This is just their way to make sure there's no liens on the property if you forget to pay your taxes, for example, and to make sure that the uh, insurance is actually current and stayed up to date in the event of an accident. If you're the type of investor who has more experience, chances are you might have called the bank like I have in the past and just requested them to remove the escrow from the mortgage payment. And what it does is that it lowers your monthly payment. Mm -hmm. um, you get more cash flow today. However, you're still responsible for paying the property taxes and the uh, insurance. So, but you're gonna have to make those payments at the end of the billing cycle or at the end of the year, whichever breakdown you have for your properties. So if you choose to break it down and take care of property taxes, and the insurance on your own, it becomes an operating expense. But if you let the mortgage company take care of it, then it becomes a financial expense because they're taking care of everything. All you gotta do is just to make one payment and they'll just, you know, divide and conquer and make sure everything gets paid. So now that you mentioned something about escrow, I remember you mentioning to me that sometimes even the mortgage companies, they're not timely with their payments for the escrow. So would you be able to elaborate more about that? Yeah, um, so the way it works with property taxes is that most states, they send you um, kind of like a quote, not a bill, halfway through the year. So in the summer, you should expect to see something in the mail saying, oh, we did a market valuation and this is what we think your property is worth according to market standards. And therefore, this will be um, your property taxes for next year you can choose to accept or you can choose to reject mm -hmm. and you have to justify why you're rejecting the increase usually is an increase even if you reject they might say we don't care and they still charge you but hey they they give you the option to reject it right and then a couple of months afterwards they will send you an actual bill uh or they will send it to the bank if it's set up in escrow but you have the option to go online and check the bill yourself and they provide you with incentives. So if you pay in October, it's going to be cheaper. And then if you pay in November, then it's going to be slightly more expensive. And then if you pay in December, then it's going to be even more expensive. And then if you pay in January, chances are you might be considered delinquent depending on the state that you are. <laughs> and what a term. Um, yeah, and sometimes lenders don't pay by the end of December because I don't know, the holidays got in the way. Um, there's a bit of a grace period, so you're not necessarily considered delinquent if the bank pays in January. But my preference is to always pay the property taxes in October. I mean, why would I want to give money away from my cash flow um, if I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to maximize my cash flow. So that's, that's what you meant by the double-edged sword. But I guess it all depends on how much you have in your plate. Sometimes it is convenient. Uh, especially if you're the type of person who might get forgetful, especially around the holidays. Mm. And the last thing you want is to have your tax bill delinquent. Like, then in that case, no, no. the bank <laughs> comes in handy and pays. But if you are the type of person who likes to keep everything organized and is setting up reminders and you have a very fixed schedule where you sit down once a month just to pay all your bills, then that might be the perfect model for you. I have done both. Uh, at the beginning, I have been very on point with paying but uh towards the end uh, i have to admit that sometimes i have become a little bit forgetful i don't go delinquent but let's say i don't necessarily pay in october like i wind up paying in november or december just because i got caught up with work and that's when i started realizing that there's a a, a certain benefit to letting the bank take care of things because that means one less thing off your place so you can focus on other things that might true. be more important true 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 mm -hmm really like those tips. So you were mentioning also that the mortgages, they already have an insurance for you. What if you want to pick a different type of insurance? Meaning, I don't know, can you do that? Well, I mean, you are free to choose what company you want to work with, right? So I think the question you meant to ask is like, what type of insurance are usually required by the sure, lawyers? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and 
for the most part, generally speaking, you just want an insurance for your house where general liability is included in there, damages to the structures and stuff like that. That's kind of like the general requirement. It's just one insurance, but sometimes things might change depending on the location of your property and uh, the amount of down payment you put in towards the property. So in those instances, the bank could demand you to have more than just one insurance. So we already got like the general liability one where it covers the structures and damages and stuff like that. You could get asked to get a flood insurance if your property happens to be on a flood zone. I know this is something we talked about in the prior episode um, when I discussed how some of my uh, properties in the 17 unit complex happen to be on a flood zone. Uh, that's non-negotiable. Uh, the way the bank determines or finds out whether your property is on a flood zone is that they always order a survey before financing the property. So they send a specialist out there to check out the area. That person represents the bank uh, or they say it's independent, but I, who knows? but they study the area and they just simply say, well, this place is located at a certain elevation. They do the background check on the property uh, in terms of like structure. This is made out of whatever material. And they also check uh, into the FEMA system to see if FEMA actually deemed that property uh, to be in a flat zone because of the elevation. And if that property happens to be in a flat zone, the bank will demand you to have flood insurance and that's an additional cost that you're gonna have to you know make sure you include in your calculations because it could make or break a deal if the cost is relatively low you might want to still want to proceed with the purchase of that property but if it puts you in a negative or maybe the reduction of the cash flow is not to your standards you might choose to walk away from it because it is a cost uh, the good news is that sometimes the flood zones go away. So let's say, for example, FEMA might deem your property to be in a flood zone for the first three years. And then a couple of years later, they send out another surveyor and they say, oh, it is no longer a flood zone anymore because I don't know. The land grew. I, I don't know. <laughs> and they go and they update that in, in, in FEMA. And hey, surprise, you're no longer required to have uh, flood insurance anymore. And that is this, you can actually request for the policy to be canceled and you send the evidence to the bank and that's the end of the story. But as long as it is currently required, you cannot negotiate that. So that's on the uh, flood insurance side. So we got general liability structure and the uh, third type of insurance that could be required. It's for deals and where you're paying less than 20%. I know there are a lot of people who follow us in the channel who buy multifamilies and there's a lot of instances like for example even in New York that's very common to see a investor come in and buy a three-family house or a four-family house. Uh, they live in one floor and then they just rent out the other ones. So technically it is an investment property but also it is used as your primary residence and when that happens the buyer or the investor could actually qualify for one of those mortgages and where you can pay a low down payment and a low down payment it's anything that's under 20 percent so let's say you come in and you say hey i want to buy this house i only want to put five percent down right and you qualify for one of those low down payment programs um yes the bank is gonna help you with the financing but hey from five to twenty there's a 15 percent gap and the bank doesn't like that. So what they do is that they demand the buyer to purchase an additional insurance on top of everything else called the private mortgage insurance, popularly known as PMI. And so that is also another added cost. Otherwise, they just say, I don't want to lend you the money. And yes. And, and that's where insurance sometimes gets that reputation and we're like, oh, that insurance is useless in a way because you're not going to reap the benefit of it, you as a buyer. That insurance is to protect the bank, right? To protect the bank in case you default, in case you cannot pay or decide not to pay. They still want to be able to recuperate the 15% um, that's missing in that equation. And um, you're basically paying money 
to benefit the lender. But, uh, what a beautiful business on their side. <laughs> but hey, they're lending you the money. So is their terms. Whoever holds the money has the power. And you can choose to not do that and, and come up with the remaining 15%. And you will just pay 20% down. But if you want to do a purchase with less than 20%, those are the rules. And those are the type of insurance that will come into play depending on the deal and the location as well. Now, the follow-up question to this one is, do you prefer an insurance that has some deductible or not? Uh, I don't seem to remember ever encountering a insurance that doesn't have a deductible. In my experience, all insurance have deductible. I think where the key difference is, is how much of a deductible do you want? So the correlation is the lower the deductible, the higher the insurance cost, the higher the deductible, the lower the insurance cost. What is a deductible for those who don't know? Uh, is what you have to pay out of pocket before the insurance kicks in. So let's say, for example, you had a damage in one of your properties and the total damage came out to be a hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars so your insurance let's say has a deductible of two thousand so you have to pay two thousand dollars out of your pocket and then the insurance will come in and cover the remaining ninety eight thousand so in my experience i always prefer to get an insurance that has a higher deductible because i am trying to maximize that cash flow so the cheaper the insurance the more cash flow i get And it also depends on where you're investing. If you know there's a low likelihood that something will happen to that property, I take my chances. And there are some areas in where I wouldn't even take those chances. Um, This is not a golden rule. Usually in my experience, it has worked. Uh, But there are some areas in where regardless of the deductible, the insurance doesn't really change much. So um, what I typically do before buying insurance and even when I'm reshopping for insurance or when I'm about to renovate my existing insurance policy. So typically the way I do this is that when it comes time to either buy new insurance or reshop insurance or even renew my existing insurance policy, I reach out to the broker and I ask them, hey, can you give me a quote with the lowest deductible possible? And also give me another quote with the highest deductible possible. More often than not, that difference between the lower deductible and the higher deductible could translate to thousands of dollars in the insurance for the most part. But there are places and where insurance doesn't really work that way. And I have had instances and where I have requested both. And the difference was so minute that it wasn't even worth it. Let's say like a hundred dollars, right? I mean, it might seem like it's some money, but when you're taking a hundred and divide it by 12 months out of the year, like it's just so minute what you're saving. And you don't want to find yourself caught up in, in a policy where you're saving so little. And then in the event that something happens, you're going to have to pay such a high deductible on the insurance. So in those instances, I go for the lowest deductible as possible because the savings were not worth it. But for the most part, I choose the highest deductible. In the case of the 17 unit portfolio, there was an instance in where I really needed to use the insurance due to a claim caused by fire. And uh, I actually had the highest deductible, so I had to pay that deductible out of pocket. And what I did was I just simply leveraged the 0% credit cards and where I pay for the cost and then Once I pay for it, the insurance covered the rest. And I had, you know, the introductory offer to pay the credit card back, you know, slowly but surely without having to worry about any interest accumulating. Now, I want to take a moment to talk to you about Fun & Grow. Fun & Grow, it's a company, a done-for-you company that works with real estate investors and helping them get up to $250,000 in liquid money at 0% interest. This is a great offer, especially if it's at 0% because you don't have to worry about interest payments anymore. And with that cash, you can actually use it to either expand your business or invest in real estate and continue to expand your real estate portfolio. So take advantage of this amazing offer with Fun & Grow by clicking on the link on the screen. Let's get back to the video. And for you, how much was that deductible when the property got burned? It happened so long ago, but I think it was ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand um, dollars. Yeah, I think so, but yeah. don't quote me on. Yeah, that. and once again, you used a zero percent uh, APR credit cards to 
pay mm -hmm. and brilliant move. Nice. Now, the next question that I have for you is what factors can affect the cost of an insurance, in your opinion? Well, um, the first one will be the deductible, I will say. Uh, the second one is how old is the property? Um, that doesn't necessarily translate to only newer properties or good investments and old properties are bad investments. But let's face it, um, older properties were built in a different era with different co-regulations and stuff like that. Yeah. And those constructions or co-regulations, they change over time. Uh, sometimes they even ch change from one year to another. So new constructions will more likely be up to co. And when everything is up to co, there's less for the insurance to worry about covering. So the newer the construction, the cheaper it is. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that having a property, it's, it's a bad one. Uh, another uh, factor that could impact your premium and the insurance is if your property is located either on a high crime area or close to a high crime area. Let, let's say like the next neighborhood or something like that. Uh, that could also impact it and your credit score. Believe it or not, um, it is a business at the end of the day, but you are the face of your business, of your real estate investment. So if your credit is not good, then um, it could impact your insurance as well. And another factor that could also impact the cost is if you had a prior claim. Um, it, and it doesn't matter with what company. So you can have a claim with company A and then you decide not to do business with them and you go to company B. That stays in the system. It, it's kind of like a like an internal system that insurance company use, and they can see that you already made a claim in the past, regardless of the company. And that new company that is about to insure you or that same company can see in the system, hey, you already had a claim. So that means you are considered higher risk. And because of that, that means we have higher chances that you're going to come back to us and make another claim. So we need to charge you more money. Hey, pure gossip between companies. Yeah. Another factor that can uh, impact the cost of your premium, if, if your property happens to be located in an area where there's a high percentage of claims. So there are areas where um, there's a high likelihood of people committing fraud, people damaging their properties on purpose, uh, just so they can claim insurance money. And um, that actually spreads out within an area, like once it begins with one, then the other, and then the other. And then the area develops a kind of like a bad reputation with the insurance company. And if your property happens to be located in an area like that, then chances are your insurance premium will also go up, even though you have not claimed anything in the past or if you have external credit. This reminds me of a story that has happened to me in the past where someone approached me. He wanted to pay me about $50,000 Every time I will crash a car or the, or I will let someone crash me so I can claim the insurance money. And obviously I said no to this type of work. Why would you risk your life for like $50,000? You can be yeah. paralyzed, like not walk again. It's not even worth it. Go and kill yourself, but we'll pay you $50,000. No, hell no. <laughs> so the next question that I have for you is how can property owners then can lower their insurance rates? So one way, and I know it might sound kind of redundant, but it's calling your insurance broker and ask them about how different would your rate be if you increase the deductible. Um, another way to do that is by calling your insurance broker and then just simply ask them that question. Hey, is there anything in particular that the insurance companies are looking for? that we can add to the property or fix in the property and make a change in the property in order to decrease the premium. And more often than not, they'll tell you, oh, well, the reason why your insurance cost is so high is because your roof is, I don't know, it's old. Maybe if you renovate the roof or you upgrade the roof, um, you can save a couple of thousands from there in future years to come. And typically a good roof will last you a good 10 to 20 years, depending on the type of construction that you have. So I find it to be an investment that is very well worth it, especially if you can finance it at a 0% interest rate. So another way to help reduce that premium is by working on your credit score because at every renewal, insurance companies, they do a soft pull on you. 
and you might not see the actual pole unless you follow yourself poles very closely but they kind of like get a gist of how you're doing with your insurance and there's usually a correlation and how good your credit score is with um the premium that you do get at renewal at any point at time this was great Vasily. Uh, but i still have one more question for you how do you claim an insurance so let's say something happened to your property like who do you call do you get a letter once you want to claim your insurance how does that what is the process like well typically the way you put a claim in your insurance is well first you call your insurance broker and let them know what's happening and the next thing they're going to ask you to do is to file a police report don't ask me why it seems to be standard like every time you're about to put a claim you have to call the police have the police write up a report or the firefighter department in the event that there was a fire um, to for them i guess it's just one way to corroborate that that in fact did happen mm -hmm. and so they're going to set up a claim make sure you do it asap um, I believe, depending on the state, uh, you have up to 12 months to file a claim, sometimes even 24 months. In my mind, I don't understand why would you want to wait 24 months to file a claim. I mean, especially if you're waiting for the money to rebuild the property and put it on the market ASAP. Um, so you shouldn't wait on that. So to recap, you contact the insurance broker, you file a police report, they're going to submit everything to the insurance company, and they're going to open up a file or a case and then they will provide you additional instructions as to what else they need. Typically, what they will require you to do is just to contact a specialist, um, whoever you need to contact to fix whatever damage is in your property, call it a roofer or a contractor that can help you with the kitchen renovation or whatever it is that got damaged. And they're gonna provide you with a quote and you submit that quote to the insurance company and what they do is that they should pay you the amount of that quote. Sometimes they pay you everything in a lump sum and that's the end of the story, but sometimes they will pay you the money and then ask you for evidence after the project is done because videos, they- Videos, images. Yeah, videos or pictures because they wanna make sure that I guess the work has been done and they also need that in order to close the file. Uh, I've also heard some instances in where that the disbursement of the insurance are done and uh, different payments. So instead of giving you everything at once, they give you a portion of it. And then after you've completed a certain part of the project, then they'll give you the other chunks and so on. So it will entirely depend on your insurance company. Awesome. So I have an additional question, but this one's going to be for them. Have you shared this video? And if you haven't, please share it with your family and friends. Anything else that you want to add? Uh, no, well, if you haven't checked the 17-unit uh, sale video, here it is. Make sure you check it out, and we'll be seeing you in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. See ya.